Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are talking about the Gospels. This is Gospels part 88. Last week we were still in that story where Jesus was dining and reclining with some Pharisees, uh, seemingly at a Sabbath meal in the evening, yeah. and had this particular person that was, he seemed to be on board with what Jesus was saying and was like, blessed is everyone who's going to eat the bread in the kingdom of God, and Jesus is kind of putting everybody in their place again to remind them of this concept of counting the cost of what it means to be a follower in this upside-down kingdom that Jesus is inaugurating during his ministry on earth. Um, and he gives a couple parables. The first one is about the man in the banquet and inviting many people and had all these different individuals in the store giving excuses and not seeing that in some ways you have to pick up your cross, you have to crucify yourself in some way in order to take hold of this mission, this message of redeeming the world through mercy and sacrifice, compassion, the goal of the law. Yeah. Um, and then, man, such extreme sounding language when he says things like if you don't hate your father and mother and wife and children over me uh, then you can't be a part of the kingdom we we tried to get the at the heart of that to say that he's talking about preference that's a hebraic type of expression in his culture to say that c concerning the things of god nothing should come close in terms of preference and priority not your family yeah. not your career not your desires your dreams all those should be filtered through who you know god to be and what he is about each and every day of your life yeah um and then he ended off with a couple more parables about the the desiring to build a tower and like first sitting down and counting the cost of whether you have enough resources to build it or a king getting ready to go into war and sitting down and deliberating before the battle is happening. And he's just laying all this out to show that choosing to become a, a disciple of Jesus shouldn't be taken lightly. Uh, it's a high calling. It's a high cost. You have to give up a lot of things in order to take on these values of the kingdom of God. Yeah, it's a really big deal. And, you know, let's let's just say, in the modern world, if you say that someone is salty, that's usually not a compliment. No. And, but in Jesus' day, it's like, hey, if you're not salty, you're just for the manure pile, pal. <laughs> Try saying that five times fast. So, yeah, yeah, this is, it's, a, a, it's amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. And, you know, we, we've said it before. I mean, sometimes it seems like maybe Jesus is being a little grumpy or this or that or whatever. And we've talked about, hey, he's getting near the end. He understands the gravity of what's going. He knows exactly what is coming, all this stuff. I don't know. It's a it's a big deal. But, you know, Jesus, he's still the nice one, if you want to think of it that way. <laughs> so let's go on. I don't think of it that way, but whatever. Let's go on. We're going to start in Luke. We're in chapter 15. And first we're going to read a section... Uh, Verses 1 through 7. It says this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents 
than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Oh, Samuel, I can feel the goodness that's going to come from this one. (laughs) But this is one of those favorite parables. Everybody loves to talk about it. We got songs about it, all this stuff. It's all great. But let's see if we can see maybe a little deeper into this one. Let's see what we got going on. So you got some scribes and Pharisees. That's pretty normal. And they're offended. And they're offended because Jesus, he not only had sinners and tax collectors following him around, but he was willingly receiving them. And, and I mean, he probably ate with them and stuff. You know, it, it, it's, he was hanging out with them. It was okay with Jesus. Now, from their perspective, the scribes and Pharisees, this is just a big eek moment. Eek. They would never do that. And they may even thought, they may have thought that, you know what? That, that makes Jesus a sinner right along with them. Now, that's probably not a, that's obviously not a fair thing to do, but, you know, people judge people that way. They do stuff. So, Jesus, he gets this, and he's like, all right, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell you some parables. Now, we've only read the first one. This is the one about the lost sheep. Just so you know, we got two more coming, the lost coin and the prodigal son. And they all have a common theme and message. And they all work together to drive home the point. So hopefully we're going to get all three right here in this episode today and it'll be good. So let's go through this. So you got a shepherd. And in this case, uh, you could say it was God. You could say it was Jesus. I don't know that it matters too awful much, but he has 100 sheep. Now, this is important. The 100 sheep represent Israel, not Christians, Israel, because we are back in the first century These are Jews. Okay. Now, 99 sheep are with him. And in this case, they're actually considered to be the righteous ones. That's the 99 sheep. And then you have one sheep that's lost, and that represents a single sinner. And now, just to say this, this parable is not to scale, if you know what I'm saying. (laughs) Jesus isn't suggesting that 99% of Israel was righteous and only 1% was not or something like that. No, and and he's not trying to say anything about anything like that. It's just a story. He's emphasizing the importance or the value of just the one who is lost. How important they are in God's eyes, okay? So just had to get that out of the way. So the shepherd, this is interesting, he leaves the 99. And remember, those are the righteous who already know God's ways. They are in his fold, under his loving care, that kind of thing. And he leaves them to go search for the one. Now, again, I have to say this out loud. Nobody is suggesting that God is going to leave some unprotected in danger, you know, sheep without a shepherd, while he's off, you know, searching for a lost one. Okay, that's not the point of the story. This is a parable, and we've said this in the podcast before. It's very important. The parables often have a single message. And when you try to to dig too deep or try to find too many other things inside it, it can get you in trouble. So, No, he's not saying that 99% of Israel is righteous. No, he's not trying to represent God as leaving, you know, righteous ones unprotected or whatever. It's a parable. Remember his point. It's it's how how important or how, how much value there is in the lost one in God's eyes. So anyway, this shepherd, he finds the lost sheep. What that means in real life is that the sinner repents. And returns, you know, to the fold, if we could say it that way. And so the shepherd rejoices. In fact, not just him, all of his friends and neighbors rejoice with him. And in that sense, you could think of the angels, etc. Who, whatever is in the heavenlies, right? They're joining in with God, rejoicing at one sinner who repents. So the meaning of this parable, especially for these grumbling scribes and Pharisees, was this. Of course, Jesus was with sinners because they were the ones who needed him. And I'm sure this rings a bell about some other uh, uh, scripture in the Gospels. It's the sick who need a physician, right? So it's a, there's a very similar parable uh, that's actually in Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. 
But the interpretation, this is interesting, is very different there. The point there in Matthew 18 is that God doesn't wish to lose even a single one, a single sheep or a single uh, single sinner. It stresses that we must care for the weak and the disadvantaged, whether that's physically or spiritually or whatever. But here, the point is more about the joy of God at the repentance of even a single sinner. So it's kind of cool. You see Jesus using the same story in more than one situation and meaning a very different thing in the context. So it's 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 cool and it's a good lesson about how we need to regard these parables in their context, etc. Now, here's a question for you, Samuel. Does Jesus or did he did he care about the religious people? Not like the scribes and Pharisees. Did he care about them? I mean, of course he did. He should be cared about all humanity. Yeah. And in some ways, and if you've ever lived in a family or, I don't know, some other relationships, you might even begin to think he actually cared for them, I don't know, a lot or maybe more than others or something. Why? Because he was always rebuking the religious leaders and, and the other religious. He, he was being nice to the sinners, but he's, he's, he's not, it, well, Samuel, do you think he's rejecting the religious in favor of sinners? I'm kind of getting the vibe that instead he's treating them to a higher standard maybe, and that's why yeah. he's being harder on them. Exactly, yeah. And so what we could say is that Jesus is simply acting appropriately toward each group. So you've got the religious, and, and they're demonstrably more righteous because they're actually you know pursuing it, and they needed to be prodded and poked because they needed to, as you said, attain a higher standard. Now, they may have felt picked on. I don't know. But you know what? They needed it. That is what was appropriate for them. However, the sinners, well, they needed to be drawn in. Like for them, it was more like persuasion, attraction, to repentance, uh, you know, to returning to God. Now, give them a little time actually repenting and, and actually trying to live out their their life, their, their, call it religious life, whatever. They, too, would have their standard raised, and, and they hopefully would then have been able to accept it. The 99, that is the righteous sheep, didn't need the same kind of TLC that the one lost sheep needed. And what's really cool about that, again, the scope or the scale of this isn't, isn't correct or accurate, but if, we, if we're looking at this, we're just trying to be logical and careful, we actually see that Jesus is grouping the scribes and Pharisees together, and I would say, as the 99 sheep in the story. The scribes and Pharisees in this little situation right here, they represent the already righteous ones, the ones who are already in the fold. Very interesting, and I know that's, it's, it's a complicated thing looking at the story, but we just need to recognize Pharisees aren't all bad guys. Scribes aren't all bad guys. And there's something valuable in what they're doing. And because they they don't understand so much of the spirit or the real uh, goal of the law. They, they seem to treat it too much as rules. In spite of that, they are very faithful and loyal, and there's some goodness in that, and we need to be careful not to just toss that out like it doesn't mean anything. So anyway, chew on that for a while. Yeah, that's good. Um, that element that you're getting at with how Jesus is interacting to these two distinct groups the Jewish leadership compared to the the common people that he's interacting with that the religious leaders are considering sinners and the the low life of society I'm I'm getting language of Paul the Apostle in I, I mean I'm, I'm thinking there's more than one reference but the one that came to mind is first Corinthians chapter 3 verse 2 
where he's writing to the assembly of Corinth, and he says, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. And yeah. and then he's like rebuking them, saying like, indeed, you are still not ready. So in some ways you could say that Jesus is interacting with these sinners, quote unquote, in a milk fashion, and he's yeah. interacting with the Pharisees and the scribes in a solid food fashion. Yeah, that's good. That's a really good way to see it. I think that's exactly right. And, you know, just to sort of carry that forward and translate it into modern church culture, Christian culture, whatever, now, I may be offending people right now with what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Generally speaking, from what I have witnessed in the church in America, which, okay, it's not like a huge sample or anything, but I'm a guy, I've, I've experienced it, pretty much everybody's sucking on milk bottles. Mm. That's all they got. There's nobody providing real meat. And so hopefully that's something we're doing here on this podcast. That's certainly a goal, whether we're pulling it off or not. I guess that's beauty in the eye of the beholder kind of thing. But yeah, that's uh, don't be satisfied with milk. You need to get on eating that meat. It's what's for dinner. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's go on. So remember, we said there were three parables. We're going to do the second one now. Uh, this is Luke 15, verses 8 through 10. It says this. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Okay. Now, actually, this parable seems a whole lot like the first one. I mean, these are really, really close. It's just coins instead of sheep. And so since we've already, you know, done the identification of these three parables working together in a series, whatever, oh, we need to be careful. Let's just make sure that we're careful to remain consistent in our interpretation throughout. So uh, this, we're not going to talk a whole lot about the text. We're just going to show the, the relative comparison here. So we've got the woman that lost the coins. Well, she's the same as the shepherd. Who lost a sheep. The woman lost a coin, shepherd lost a sheep, and that represents God or Jesus. So the 10 coins, that's equal to the 100 sheep, and that is Israel. And then you have the nine coins, that's equal to the 99 sheep, and those represent the righteous. You have the one coin, that's equal to the one sheep, and that represents a sinner. And then this whole idea of finding the coin, it's the same as finding the sheep, and that is equal to the sinner repenting. And then the rejoicing is the same in both. You've got God and the whole host of heaven rejoicing over repentance. And that's the important part. The rejoicing is over repentance. And then sort of the, I don't know, the, the, the summary or conclusion or whatever. Jesus came for sinners of his generation, not for the righteous. But, just to say it again out loud, this doesn't communicate any sort of rejection of the righteous or abandonment of the righteous or any of that. It's just that they are not the ones in dire need. So, he's here for the sinners. So, anyway, there you go. Those two, perfect lineup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. it's almost as if you get the sense that Jesus is... And it, it goes back to our previous talks about parables, not meaning to create confusion among the hearers, but to bring clarity, yeah. and that this is a form of a reinforcement from his previous and first parable. And, you know, in some ways, you have to think that he has a diverse audience who's listening, and particular people are going to connect to different stories whether they're more in touch with 
shepherd culture or they're a female and, you know, in a family with scrounging for money to be able to survive and this story connects with them so i just think it's cool that he's flexing his teaching nature again by doing what any good teacher should do is like you you state the 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 equation or the the problem and then you reinforce it by doing further examples yeah and he's and Another thing in this one, because it's a series of three together, those first two were very important because they really laid a solid foundation. And this third one, it's it's, comparatively speaking, it's really long and there's a lot going on. So let's go ahead and start looking at that one. Uh, Again, we're in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 19. Was there something, Samuel? (laughs) Yeah. There, I did have one other thing I wanted to ask, and I oh. think it 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 will tie into this third one well when we get to it uh, okay. at the end. So this dichotomy of the rejoicing that's happening between the one group that's repenting and then the others that aren't because they're living righteously, is, is there, literally, is there a form of hyperbole going on here because... You have oh, to think yeah. that if someone is living righteously, that there's going to be high levels of rejoicing for that person because what God wants for humanity is to have them live good and well in what his instruction says. And so I, is he just focusing on how far that sinful person has come from darkness blindness death everything into a new way but that's not trying to diminish the rejoicing that will still happen for the one who did everything right the best to their ability yeah yeah and this this is uh, i think uh, a great example of how you got to be careful with the parables as a general rule they're trying to get across a single idea so what is the single idea it is that God and all of the heavenlies rejoice over just one sinner repenting. So it's not saying anything about the righteous. It's not throwing them under the bus. It's not saying they're not rejoiced over too. It's not saying any of that stuff. So why is he saying this in this parable? Because remember where we started? Jesus was hanging out with sinners and tax collectors, and the scribes and Pharisees were grumbling. Mm. And so Jesus' point is to go, you guys, you're you're not seeing how important this is. You need to know how important even one sinner repenting is to God. If you could see that the way that I see it, you would not be grumbling that I was hanging out with them. You would want to hang out with them too. Hmm. So, and again, it doesn't mean that He couldn't use the exact same parable in a different context and actually have a different meaning. But right here, that's what it's talking about. So, yeah, it's not make it's not making any statements about the righteous. It's just not. So I don't know. Does does that help? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. And I've I've got something specific in particular in mind to connect it to with this next parable. So we should move on to that one and circle back to this. All right. Ooh, circle back. All right. Uh, Once again, Luke 15, verses 11 to 19. All right. And this isn't even all of it. So let's go. Says this. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, (laughs) give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed 
with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Okay. Now, because you see these three connected together, this is this one is really easy to see how repentance is really involved in the story. But let's let's see what we got here. Jesus, he starts out with this long parable about a man with two sons, and it's important to keep in mind this is the third parable. They're working together with the first two. They all make the same basic point, and that is rejoicing over repentance. But I guess the idea is together they make it better or clearer. So this parable, though, it's now shifting the focus from the seeker, that would be the shepherd or the woman, like God or Jesus, and it's shifting the focus to the lost, the sheep or the coin or the son in this case, right? So we're, we're looking at it from a different perspective. So the younger son, he, he appears to be uh, what we today might call um, an idiot. Let's just say that. Hey, Dad, uh, I know you're not dead yet, but I don't want to wait. So give me my inheritance now. <laughs> to which, I don't know about you, when I was growing up, that would have been met with... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? But here's the thing. This wasn't completely and totally unheard of in the first century Jewish life. But it would have been super rare, and it usually would have been for much better reasons than what we are seeing here. Okay, there would have just been some weird special circumstance. Maybe we can't even think of one, whatever. But it, it would happen. A father would go ahead and and uh, distribute you know, the, the inheritance or whatever. But here, in this case, this boy, he's basically just despising his father's very life. Just just despising it. And and okay, rather than looking up from a pool of blood wondering what happened, <laughs> the son is actually given what he has asked for by the father. It's kind of crazy. Now, joking aside, it's an important life lesson. Sometimes God gives you what you ask for or gives you what you want even when he knows it's not best for you. Or is it? Right? <laughs> That's the thing. Let's find out. So this father, he divides his property between them and we will see later in the story that the older son didn't even get his share at this time. So the father divides it, but he gives the younger son his portion only. He's the only one to get some. So the father does the work. And by the way, the division, just so we can make this clear, it would have gone something like this. There would have been a double portion for the oldest son and then a single portion for all other sons. Now, in this case, we only know of two. So what we believe here is that the younger son would have been given one third of all of the father's wealth. Now, it doesn't actually explicitly say that he's wealthy, but the story implies it. He's got many paid servants and, you know, all this kind of thing. So it appears that he is wealthy. The younger son gets a third and blows it. All right. So the younger son, uh, he takes everything he's given. And, uh, you know, you got to figure just pragmatically, he probably converted a bunch of this stuff into some form of currency or whatever, to make it easy to travel with. He goes far away from his father and it, so when he goes far away, you might even wonder, is that really far away in distance? Is he far away in terms of culture? Is he far away in terms of character? And, hmm. okay, probably? Yes, yes, yes. But he blows it all. He blows it all on wasteful, reckless, useless stuff. And he's left with nothing to show for it. He has no assets. And he has no friends. Life lesson. Hope you're paying attention. 
It's a truly poignant picture of many people's lives in relation to God. And again, I'm doing this a lot on this up just to say it out loud. The younger son represents the tax collectors and the sinners. Now, in a way, I'm I'm actually not going to talk about this, but I'll just lay this down. Maybe this is like one of those little extra bonus things that people can spend time on. If you look carefully into this, you can kind of see a sly knock on the Herodians in in this whole little story, uh, and Herod Agrippa especially. That's another story for another day. I'm not going to spend any time on it. So anyway, you got this this younger son. Hey, everything, you know, goes to crap, if I can say that on my podcast. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> he finds himself swine herding. So number one, he's a slave. Number two, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I put my numbers backwards. He's 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 a swine herder. That's number one. He's a slave. That's number two. And he has a Gentile master. That's number three. This dude, it's like three strikes and you're out. He's in a bad spot. Now, from a Jewish perspective, this is like the proverbial bottom of the barrel. But hey, if you've ever talked about that, we also know there's mercy at the bottom of the barrel. And so this young man is now able to see the truth of his situation. And he's able to see that he had, in fact, brought it upon himself. And then all of a sudden, (laughs) not really, but, you know, it's the way it reads. He was keenly aware of the one source of goodness in his life, and he knew he needed to return. Now, in the story, that's to his father. And he also recognized, and this is important, he recognized that he had forfeited his sonship by his decisions and actions. I hope you're hearing how this relates to, you know, like you, an individual person, and God, as we see it in this story between this young son and his father. But he also knew, and this is another good thing, he recognized that it would be better to be in his father's care, even if it was only as a servant or a slave, at least far better than to remain in his own care. I hope you're picking up on those vibes. And just a side note, uh, carob pods, that's probably what they were talking about when they said the pods that they were given to the pigs. They were known as food for the poor. And and they were actually in and of themselves symbolic of the need for repentance. So it's kind of cool that in the story, they represent food for the poor and that fits the story, but they also represent the uh, symbolism for needing repentance, which also fits the story. I mean, it's, it's good little storytelling here that Jesus, he's quite a storyteller. Uh, just one last thing. I've heard people talking about this parable and they try to make this younger son out to be a kind of a, a like a continual conniving manipulator sort of person. And that, you know, he was only returning because he knew that he could use his father some more, take advantage of his father some more. And I just have to say, that is diametrically opposed to the point of this parable. To understand this parable, we must see the son's actions as real repentance. Otherwise, the parable makes no sense. Now, before we go on, that was just the first part, Samuel. Thoughts, ideas, comments, something, anything? Um, Not really any questions. Maybe just a comment to say that in the patriarchal society of first century Judaism that Jesus is painting this picture, the, the sons of a father, their primary purpose, their mission was to continue on the legacy of their father by their own lives and it's almost like it it feels a bit like discipleship like imitating everything about your father that you can and then when the father dies you take up that 
cross of continuing on the family, the household, which is going to include extended family, livestock, yeah. ex- land, etc. And for the younger son to do this, it, it would be a shocking moment in the story for the listeners to hear a son do like treat his father in that way. That that so anti story compared yeah. to what the Jewish culture is so regularly known for. Yeah. Well, there's so much in that first part that's shocking. Everything that you described, the fact that he ends up with a Gentile pig farmer and he's feeding the pigs, but and then, oh my gosh, he repents. All of this. I mean, so much happened in those verses. And, but wait, there's more. <laughs> so Luke 15, verses 20 to 24. Let's go ahead and continue with this part, Samuel. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. It's kind of cool, right? Mm. So the son had a plan. And he carried it out. He turned from the life that he was leading. And he humbly returned to his father. This is repentance. But here's the thing. The father saw him, even while he was still a long way off, felt compassion, ran to him, embraced him, kissed him, all of that. Okay, this is forgiveness. This is such a great picture of who God is toward us. When he sees someone returning to him, someone truly, sincerely, honestly repenting, He's going to meet them even while they are still far from him. He is moved with compassion and quick to forgive. His true desire is to have you near him. But it's got to start with repentance. But again, the son, this son in the story, he's faithful to his plan. He starts his speech and I think that we could, you know, think of that as his confession before God. But now notice he didn't say it all, right? He didn't even get to the part where, hey, let me be a slave or something like that. The father interrupts him. He doesn't get a chance to finish. It's not that he left it out on purpose. He didn't get to finish. Now, I've heard some say that this, you know, it was the son who had decided, you know, not he was going to leave that part out, and you know, he's uh, he's just looking for whatever opportunities. Maybe I can still squeeze some more out of good old daddy o, you know, that kind of thing. You're defeating the point of the parable. It can't be. He was trying to do it, but the father interrupted him. And again, that's a picture of God. He is he is there. He's moved by repentance and responding accordingly, just like this father. Th- this father, which, of course, represents God, he's nobody's fool. It's not like he doesn't recognize everything that's happened there, but he is quick and lavish with his forgiveness when he recognizes true repentance. This is a big deal. It's a big deal. So though the son imagined that his behavior had disqualified him from being this man's son any longer. And there's a certain amount of truth in that, if we're being honest. But the father was having none of that. The father celebrates that he has found his lost son, just like the celebration over the sheep and the coin. All three parables making the same point. Their celebration in heaven over repentance. And it's a great image to have firmly 
planted in your head. It is great to see the awesomeness of God's response. And like, this is one of those points where, you know what? Even real men just might cry at this, right? This is good (laughs) stuff. But I'm going to say it again. We can't overlook the thing that prompted it. Repentance. Hmm. Yeah, it's good. It's it's so refreshing to hear these reminders about the attributes of God and how the the things of the world and our tendencies to forget the story of God. It's it's just a humbling reminder to to see His heart behind things. Yeah. Um, and another cultural thing, people might know this, people might not. Um, I have heard and read before that in patriarchal society, it was unheard of for the father of a house to be seen publicly running. Like the the fact that he went out of his house and ran towards his son is like breaking a cultural norm. Um, to, to showcase the response and emotion that seeing his repenting son come back to him. So I think that shows, again, the lengths to which God is, in the story, is seeming to want to express to humanity yeah. his desire for repentance for them and how he will be, you know, your biggest cheerleader in those strivings to be better uh, in your life yeah 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 I don't uh, uh, I haven't read a lot about I don't know how how valid that is about the father running or whatever I mean for all I know it is but it doesn't even matter it is is expressing emphasizing giving you that image in your head of God's willingness to just, hey, I, I don't care what other people think or what I look like or whatever. He's just, he wants to go and meet and rejoice and forgive and all that. It's, it's a beautiful picture. Beautiful picture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ah, but the story isn't done, Samuel. Yeah, this is the section I am thinking of about circling back to. So, All right, we ready to go on? Let's do it. All right, here it is. Luke 15, verses 25 through 32. All right, says this. Now, his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this, your brother, was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Oh, <laughs> if if you're listening to this podcast and you're not feeling even the slightest inkling of conviction, <laughs> you need to dial nine one one because you may <laughs> you not be <laughs> alive. <laughs> you did, yeah. So uh, we have an addition now that that okay this wasn't in the preceding parables this is all new stuff and remember this all started at the beginning of chapter 15 in luke 
where it said the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Okay, this older son represents those scribes and Pharisees. They didn't like it that these prodigals, the sinners and tax collectors, were being welcomed by Jesus. Now, it's not explicitly stated here, but the inference is that they were drawing near either like because they were already repenting or they were actually open and willing to repent. That's kind of, you know, we have to sort of hold that as a like an assumption, I would say. Okay. Now, uh, notice I tried to emphasize it when I read it. The, the older son refers to him as this son of yours, but the father refers to him as your brother. Hmm. The, the older brother is trying to disown him. The father is trying to say, no, 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 no. This is your blood. So the older son, yeah, he's trying to deny any connection to the younger son, refers to him as a father, whatever. Father wants him to see him as a brother. Then he would have, I guess the point is, the, young, the, the older son would then have the heart to join in the celebration. But the older brother denies him because he's offended by him. He's offended by his actions. And this is exactly how the scribes and Pharisees were looking at the tax collectors and sinners. They needed to see them as their brothers so that they could see the reason for celebration or even the reason to, you know, invite them to repentance. You could say it that way. So super cool picture there you see with them. But it isn't all just about them. Now, let's just say this, Samuel. When you read this and you see what the older son is saying and doing and thinking and feeling, right? All of that. Does this older son kind of, is he a bit of a sympathetic character in your eyes, in your mind? The Can you older, relate to him? The older brother or the younger yeah, brother? The older one. Um, well, n- not really, because I don't classify myself as like super righteous and always doing the right thing. I always sympathize with the the younger brother because I've made many mistakes and fallen short oh. and that kind of thing. Okay. All right. All right. Well, let's just let's let's go with it from my perspective for the the story here. I think he is a very sympathetic character and here's why. If you put yourself in his shoes, it's very easy to imagine having similar thoughts and feelings. And let's just say it. It does seem unfair from his perspective. I mean, here he is. He's lived his whole life as like, you know, quote unquote, the good son. Does everything, quote unquote, right. But nobody ever celebrates him. It's like, yeah, that's what's expected and you do it. So there you go. Nothing to see here. But his brother does everything wrong. (laughs) And they throw him a party. (laughs) I mean, that's messed up, right? Yeah, this was the heart of what I was getting at. Uh, And I didn't mean to come across like I don't think that he's in the right by offering these complaints. I think that what he's saying is completely valid, uh, 100%. It's just I... I don't lean towards his character in the story as much. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get what you're saying. And I think that he's very relatable. I think that we can easily imagine ourselves acting, thinking, feeling the same way. But I'm not exactly saying he's right. (laughs) But I I totally, I mean, I'm just going to say it out loud. If I was in a family and there were only two of us and I was the older brother... Dude, I'd be acting exactly like this guy did. It's embarrassing, but I'm sorry. That's me. That It's true. But here's the thing. The older son, he's not seeing the beauty of repentance. And And I guess, to be fair, you know, who was to say that it was even real? Right? We have no real evidence here. He's just come back. That's all we know. So... If we're only judging by history, 
history would have made him skeptical, and, and I think in some sense rightly so. However, again, this is a parable. And in the parable, there is no question. The repentance is completely and totally real. But this older son is unable to either see that or accept that or whatever, and therefore he can't celebrate it. So this ends up being a cautionary tale for all of us. Now, it's it's not like there's anything inherently wrong with being skeptical. In fact, sometimes it's very appropriate and sometimes you 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 look at people around you all like it, it it's needed. I wish we had a little more skepticism. But this is also important. We can't let a person's past define them for all time. If God is willing to forgive and celebrate their new faithfulness, their new freedom, then we need to be careful not to keep them bound up by their earlier failures. We, in a sense, then are acting like an enemy of God. We're not, you know, for him or with him. We're against him. And again, the older son, I'm, I'm saying he's a very sympathetic character for many of us, but we must not be like him. Now, another important point, if we remove the older son's response to the way the father treated the younger son, you know, we're left with, you know, what is a very positive and good character. The the older son was a great character, but we're looking at this one bad response. He was faithful. He's obedient in service. And, you know, this is kind of like the way a good son should be toward his father, especially in this day and time, the first century Israel. He enjoys fellowship with the Father. He continually partakes of the Father's wealth and goodness. And if he hadn't been offended by his younger brother, I mean, he would have been the best son ever. And the Father loves him too. He loves him just as much. And I don't know. It's difficult to say. In in, in the parable, I think there's no favorites, right? He, He loves him just as much. But we have to recognize this good. This older son was a a a basically good character all the way around, except his response to this one thing. And remember, who's Jesus telling the parable to? Scribes and Pharisees. Yeah. Now, did Jesus? Did it seem like he picked on these guys a lot? Yeah. And and did this generation in Israel, did they blow it? Yes. Are the scribes and Pharisees the bad guys? No, they're not. Some are. And that would be along with, you know, some Sadducees and some Herodians, etc., whatever. But we see here, even as Jesus is, you know, in some way, he's kind of busting their chops. He's busting the chops of the scribes and Pharisees. But also notice they represented, they were represented by the 99 sheep, the nine coins, and this faithful and loyal son. So we got to remember, don't be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Recognize both the good parts and the bad parts about these characters. Give them credit where credit is due. And then ultimately, you got to say that God and or Jesus is willing to. And so if you're not, then why aren't you? So Mm. there is the three series parables about God rejoices in the repentance of even one Mm. yeah this is one of the big time teachings of jesus in the gospels for me and for so many other people across the entire world uh it's it's huge um so much of people's perspective on god and jesus 
is traced back to parables just like this one. And I think that us spending this time to dissect it, bring it into its true context, to glean the meaning that Jesus intended for it, uh, hopefully is only going to enrich others continuing meditations on this passage going forward in their walks um, let's hope pe- because it's so vital um, yeah now that would be such a perfect way to end the episode like but that's, that's not us that's that's not the way that we <laughs> roll so hopefully if people are listening by now they know that this is just normal um, I have a couple things the first is I know that there has to, and you've t- you touched on it some, that there are those that who aren't contextually getting all of this information regarding the dynamics and the relationship between older brother and father, younger brother and father, and they might come away thinking that, man, it seems like that the older brother is being neglected in some way. He's being forgotten by the father. Um, now, my authority to speak on this is it, it is literally zero because I'm not a father, but I'm trying to think hypothetically, maybe Paul, you can touch into this since you are a father. Um, mm-hmm. If I had two sons and one was just like a mess in life all the time and I was constantly having to deal with them and their lives and what was going on, the the choices that they were making, mistakes, everything. And then on the other side, I had this dutiful son who just like soaked up all of the attributes of life and integrity of how to learn how to be a young man from their ability to start learning things. Um, there would be an, for me as a, fa- as a hypothetical father, there would be this unspoken level of trust and comfort with my relationship with this older son that sometimes maybe doesn't get spoken because you're so focused on dealing with the problem of the younger son that what needs to be said towards the older son doesn't because you know that things are okay with them and you don't have to express that same kind of concern now i'm not trying to say that god is not saying what needs to be said to the older son in this story or for humanity in general but i'm just trying to give that picture that for those that are pursuing righteousness and like their lives their hearts are staked to this claim like they are unmovable and like not perfection but Nothing is going to sway them in their allegiance to God. I, I Part of me wants to feel that God's like, they know that I got them, and I know that I got them, and so I'm going to devote my attention to those that are farther off to try to bring them in um, while this person is continuing to follow me and like we have one another's back. So I'm going to stop talking for just a moment and let you react to that. Well, just uh, in response to this particular thing, uh, it is a sad, sad truth of parenting. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. But I can tell you that there is a continual source of joy in the the children who who aren't trouble, who aren't problems, who are really like you call it, like the dutiful son or, you know, that kind of thing. And the relationship is very different and, and it is understandable how the ones who never cause any trouble might feel like, gosh, you know, you're not really celebrating me. And, and it's because there is no explicit or, or, you know, like distinct moment when those things are going on. But trust me as a father, (laughs) There is celebration going on all the time. <laughs> and and it's sad that it doesn't get expressed more or whatever. And you do. You end up you end up spending your your effort and your focus uh, etc on on the trouble spots because you don't want to lose one. And uh, you'll see you're going to be a father and and you're going to hopefully you'll just have all good kids. What do I know? But uh, you will see that 
you don't want to lose any of them. Hmm. And so it's, it's what you end up doing, but yeah, it's just, it's just a sad, sad truth. Yeah. And maybe this is an example of one of those Cole Vacomer, the he break, how much more oftentimes we, we take our dynamics with our earthly temporal relationships with our parents, our fathers, our mothers, and then we try to superimpose that on how God operates. And yeah. I mean, there are similarities there, but it should showcase like if there is celebration that goes on with a father towards his son and it's imperfect and it doesn't always happen the way that it needs to, like how much more is God in heaven in the spiritual realm like truly and perfectly doing that, carrying that out, even if we're not able to comprehend it and experience it in, you know, day-to-day life in any given moment. Like it, it's a yeah. theoretical thing to think about that technically God is so much better than an earthly father and his capability to carry out yeah. his attributes as that role. Yeah, but even the, 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 the father's response in this story is like, hey, you know what? We actually have a real ongoing relationship. You're actually, we're like sharing in all of the richness and goodness all the time. Which, by the way, pulling out the fattened calf one night and having a party pales in comparison to getting to live in mm. this kind of relationship day after day after day after day after day after day after day. So there's that side of it too, where, you know, as the son, as the dutiful son, and I, you know, I can only relate to that probably from my relationship <laughs> with God later in life. <laughs> but, you know, there's that thing of, hey, you know what? God doesn't need to whip out the fattened calf for me. I'm getting to live in the richness of this relationship all the time. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't trade that for one momentary party. That f- Nothing. They, they, nothing compares. So that's kind of the how much more so. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. a. I like that perspective a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. So that hopefully taking the time to give that some space and let it breathe helps. Yeah, cement that dynamic in the story even more. Now, the second thing, um, man, it it struck me so much. You point out in the text how the older brother calls his the younger brother, this son of yours, and how the father responds by saying, like, this is your brother. And if I reflect on it enough, I have had times in my life where there have been those that have been connected with me, I've been in some sort of relationship with, and they are experiencing repentance, growth, um, change in their life. And instead of celebrating like in this story what the father is wanting for the older son to do you know what i've responded with at times i've been jealous i've been like why why is it that you know their life is going so well now and all these things are happening to them and like woe is me look where i'm at and that's such a it's such a invitation to be the empathetic brother to those who are in community with us who like experience and we see repentance happen to them and to uh bring it all around since i'm the midrash guy i actually, I actually read this uh, it was i think it was actually last night and it's oh. going to sound so weird but maybe this was providence for me reading it last night so yeah just i promise we're going to end just <laughs> Give me like another 60 to 90 seconds. So let me read this first. So according to the Midrash, there was a two-headed man that lived in the time of King Solomon. Uh, He fathered six normal children and then a seventh that was born with two heads like himself. (laughs) When the father died, the son with two heads came before King Solomon demanding a double share of the inheritance And so in response, King Solomon covered one head and poured hot water on the other. Ouch! Both heads cried out. From this, King Solomon meant to show that genetically they are one 
and should be judged as one for inheritance purposes. <laughs> now, the the book that I was reading was showcasing how we need to be called to a people who are crying out in response, crying out with others who are crying out as well, that uh, we, we don't need to be the example where someone that we are intimately connected with has boiling water pour, pouring on them and our response is to be silent and do nothing. In this case, for the brothers in the prodigal son story, you could you could say that the younger brother was having boiling water from his actions, from his choices, and he responded with silence, with defensiveness, but instead like should have responded with unified crying out together uh, because of them being uh, you know, f- both from God, both from the nation of Israel, etc. It's a yeah. crazy imagery, but I, I think it connects. I don't know. <laughs> no, it does, because, I mean, think about, uh, go a little further. When the son repents, you could think of that as having a, a soothing or healing salve applied, mm. and the older brother should have felt the relief of that, the 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 coolness, the goodness of that, and and he didn't. So yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, all of this it should be so convicting because I mean, and let's just be honest; these are all signs of you know our our immaturity. They're signs of our self centeredness. All of these things, and and Samuel, I got news for you. We've all done what you described, so you're not like confessing anything that makes you seem like the lone weirdo. It's like we're all like this, but but we have to. The, the recognizing it is super awesome because now you can begin the process of not being that anymore, mm. and you know, choosing the better thing. It's it's just all good. It's all yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, and if you've made it this far, I hope that you don't think that the midrash is like the twilight. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I had two heads, I'd say it's time to quit twice. Let's get out of here. Oki oki dokey. Thank you for listening to the Oki Doki Most podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode, and be sure to leave us a rating and a review to let us know how this content impacting your life. You can find out more information about us and the podcast at www.okidokimos.com. Please feel free to send us any questions or comments you may have to our email address, okidokimos at gmail.com. Until next time, we pray that you do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon.